Good morning and welcome. It's good to be here. It's good to see you. It's good to be in the house of God. Would you all stand with us as we sing, Here I Am to Worship. Good morning. It's wonderful to see each of you here on this beautiful and hotter than it looks like outside morning. We're glad that you're all here. And this has been a, a good life, a good week in the life of our church. Last Sunday evening, we had a church-wide picnic. And even though it stormed off and on during the day, we just had a great time when we went to the Levi Jackson Park. And tonight, we have another opportunity to fellowship together. Typically, we do our dessert auction in February around Valentine's Day to raise money for our youth for youth camp. They're going to be leaving week after next, but this year because of all of the different kind of challenges we've had, it's here it is, it, we're doing it in June. So if you can make it tonight, I promise you that you will have a great time. We can bid on some desserts. The way it works, if you haven't been there before, it's not like you just have to take everything home. When people buy things, oftentimes, unless they have something in mind, like a special event coming up, they divide and share. So you may get a chance today to taste you know, raspberry cheesecake and chocolate and all other kinds of low-fat and sugar-free things. 
Yeah. So, I've always thought, you know, if I was a cardiologist, I would show up for one of those things. <laughs> but this week we have a couple of things going on. T today the deacons are going to meet in person at four in here. We also have the food pantry, and we always appreciate your participation and help, help with that. Um, I mentioned in two weeks the youth will be going to camp in South Alabama, and so uh, over the next couple of weeks you'll get a chance to see ways that you can be in prayer in prayer for them. And also I want to mention this week we celebrated the life of Wanda Jeffries. Her funeral was here Thursday, and we had a nice meal for the family. And many of you know that extended family through school and work and dentistry and attorneys and you name it. Please keep them in your prayers. One thing I'm always mindful of is when you grieve and you lose somebody you love, it's a process. So sometimes you take a couple of steps forward and then a step back, a couple of steps forward. Let's remember them in the middle of all of that. So we're glad that you're here. You might notice on the front of the bulletin, there's a nice picture of of some grapes and a grapevine. The first several years of mine and Michelle's marriage, we lived in Charlottesville. There are a lot of vineyards around there. When we lived at Lake Monticello, when it would be cold and frost would come, the vineyards would hire local helicopter pilots to come and to hover over the fields and blow, because the air 40, 50, 100 feet above the ground is warmer than the air on the ground in the middle of the night when it's about to frost. And so, um, and those industries, I guess, could afford to pay helicopters to just sit there and hover all night. We had a dear friend who lived a few blocks from us who had a grape trellis in her yard, and she had brought that from, I think, somewhere in California, planted on both ends for two or three years in a row, had sawed it off kind of at the ground, and then built a trellis, and there we had just grapes. They were a block over. And she had encouraged me and Michelle to come over sometime and to pick grapes and to enjoy the fruit of the vine. She used them just a little bit, so we decided we were going to make grape jam. Well, we were going to make grape jelly and realize that's a lot harder than jam, so we ended up making grape jam. But she had been asking us when we wanted to come over, and like on a Monday, she said, hey, they're, you know, they're fully ripe, now's the time to come. So we decided to start on our grape jelly at about 8.30 on Wednesday night. We started over there, got eaten alive by the mosquitoes and picked the grapes and got home with several couple of five gallon buckets full of grapes. And I had the brilliant idea as a person who's never made jelly before, I had the brilliant idea, let's get it started. <laughs> and so that was like nine, nine thirty, something like that. We didn't finish. Once you start grape jelly, you don't stop until it's done. And so we went till about three or four in the morning, if I remember correctly. So that is, right there, that's the extent of my experience with jam making, except for maybe freezer jam. But to suffice it to say, we didn't know what we were getting into when we started all that. So I hope today, as you're here in a place of worship, as we talk about Jesus and his love for us, I hope you know what you're getting into. I hope you're prepared. I hope I know what I'm getting into because when we come to this place, we remember 150 years of God's faithfulness. And we remember saints that have walked around us and among us. And we remember encouragement and support. We remember challenge. We remember opportunities that we've had to serve. And we remember um, that Jesus loves each of us so very much. So I'm very glad that you're here. Let's pray. Gracious God, in these moments... We come to you, and, and there are so many things going on in our lives, and so we ask that you would take away distractions. We ask, Lord, that now you would help us to focus a, a bit on you and your goodness. I ask that you would guide the words that are spoken and the songs that are sung and the testimony that's shared. I pray, Lord, that not only would you direct those words, but I pray that you would shape our hearts so that we might hear a word from you. We know that your spirit is hovering right here. We know that you are present and you are active and you are engaged in our lives and in this moment. And so, Lord, we cling to that and we have expectations and we need your guidance. I ask, Lord, that you would guide this time that we have together and I lift up these friends to you and I ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. Let's pray together. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. Dear God, you are good, and you are kind, and you do love each one of us, and we thank you. Everyone here is carrying something, Lord. Everyone here has a burden they're concerned about. We open our hearts, and we open our ears to listen, to hear your voice today, to help us with those things. In Jesus' name, amen. So this scripture this morning will be from John 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, and ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples.
as we prepare for this portion of the service, the message, won't you join me for a moment of prayer? We lift up our eyes to the hills and we wonder from where is our help to come? And we recognize that our help comes from you, Lord, maker of these mountains and these hills, these valleys and these streams. Lord, you have been our home. You have been our safe place, our dwelling place, our abode for all time. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You are our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? You are the stronghold of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? So create in us... A clean heart, O God, renew your right spirit within us, and may the words of my mouth and may the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer, and all God's children said, amen. I wonder, when is a time that you felt like you really belonged? In a group of people, among friends, maybe family, can you think of a time when you really felt like you absolutely belonged? I was thinking about that this week, and I remember two friends in North Carolina. Both of them were deacons at the church that we served there. Both of them were actually on the committee that called us there. And we started, shortly after I came to that church, we started the habit of every couple of weeks we would go to the local yokel breakfast place and just have breakfast together. One of, one of the guys was my age. One of the guys was probably 10 years older than me. They were close friends, and they kind of included me in their friendship. And I remember we would meet over breakfast. In the beginning, I would, you know, I would offer to pray for the meal, and then we would talk about just things going on in life. And it was very helpful because, like I said, two of us were at one stage, and he was a little bit at more advanced stage. And then one day we were there eating breakfast, and this, these, these meals just meant a lot to me. I was, it was very valuable, but one day he's, one of the other individuals said, hey, could I offer the blessing? I said, oh yeah, absolutely, sure. And so when we prayed, I'll never forget the way he prayed. It was just this heartfelt, Lord, thank you for these two men and for these friends that they've become. Lord, I thank you for all that they mean to me. And I ask that you'd bless them and their families. And I ask that you'd guide our friendship. You know, but thank you, Lord, for all that they mean to me in my life. And he almost kind of choked up when he said that in the prayer. And that changed, in my heart, our friendship. Because we together were Christians serving at the same church. We talked about, sometimes we would talk shop as far as church goes. But when he prayed that way, I recognized that, you know, there is another party involved in this relationship, and that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Lord, our God, <laughs> who is in the midst, working not just in their lives, but working in my life, my life and working among us. And I can tell you that that friendship... I felt in a new way like I belonged. You know, like I belonged. Well, where have you felt like you've belonged before? Maybe in a friendship, maybe in a family, maybe at a place of work. I I hope that you'll hear today when Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And when he says, abide in me, I hope that you hear that you belong with Jesus the Savior. You belong with him. You belong in his family. You belong by his side. You belong holding his hand and taking him into your heart. You belong in that place. One of the more powerful images of Jesus in Scripture occurs, well, in my opinion, (laughs) occurs in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. There's this picture, and I want to read it to you. Jesus says, Behold, I'm standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And I decided not to do it today because I've shown this picture before to you, and all of the ones that I can pull off the Internet are not a clear picture. But there's a picture painted a couple of hundred years ago by Holman Hunt. 
And it's entitled, The Light of the World, and it has, it has Jesus standing at a door, knocking. Jesus is holding a lantern. He's traveled to this door. There are weeds and flowers growing up by the door. And Holman Hunt, when he painted that, he showed it to his friends and said, this is based on Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And one of his friends said, Holman, you made a mistake. There's no latch on that door. There's no doorknob. <laughs> and Holman said, no, I didn't make a mistake. The doorknob's on the inside. You have to open the door. You've probably seen this picture, the light of the world, Holman Hunt. You have my permission to look on Google right now if you need to. I know some of you have seen it before. That's the image I want you to have. Jesus saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. He says, abide in me. That's not a word we use often. I can't remember the last time I said it. It means live in me, live with me, live alongside me. Take me in to your heart and into your life. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Jesus says, abide in me. In other words, take your trust in me. It, give me your concerns. Let me guide your compassion. I think in a church, we help each other abide in Christ when we encourage one another on difficult days. I abide better in Christ when I see someone handle a tragedy in their lives and handle it the way I think God would have them handle it. Or when I see someone follow God's lead when they ex experience something difficult, I'm encouraged to abide more in Christ. When you abide in Christ, you, you worship Christ with your life. When you abide in Christ, you seek to be guided by His words, which means you study Scripture. And, and you read it. And you don't read it necessarily just to memorize big swaths of it. Sometimes you read it so that it can read you. You know, and you say, Holy Spirit, guide me. You are welcome here as we just sang. Um, when you abide in Christ, you, each day you, you make it a point to pray. And you lift up the needs of the people around you. And you think about your neighbors. And you think about your family. And you think about somebody you've encountered but that you don't know real well and you lift them up in prayer. Jesus says, abide in me. And one thing that happens after a time of abiding, all of a sudden, when you're living in Christ and you're asking Him to live in you, when you're relying on Him, when you're trusting in Him, all of a sudden, in the unguarded moment, your temper might not be as bad. In the unguarded moment, you find yourself showing a little bit more compassion. Or a little bit more generosity. Jesus says, Jesus says, abide in me. Notice what he says here. I'm the, fi I'm the true vine and my father's the vine grower. He removes, he prunes every branch that doesn't bear fruit. And how does he do this? He does this when we abide in him and we listen to him. All of a sudden the peripheral things, selfishness, things that our culture would teach us to do or show us to do, all of, the, all of a sudden those things don't make as much sense anymore. We recognize that Jesus is changing us from the inside out. And all of a sudden we want to be peacemakers. And all of a sudden we want to look out for others. And all of a sudden we want to not just get as much as we can get in this go-round. You know? I remember hearing about a funeral in Texas. <clears throat> of course. I'm sh I know there at least is one Texan here, so I'm not going to try to look at her. But in Texas, a guy was buried in his convertible Cadillac, lowered down into the ground. And somebody at the graveside could, could be heard saying, man, now that's living. <laughs> you can't take it with you, right? Not even a convertible Cadillac. Not even if you're Boss Hogg. <laughs> you know, when we... When we abide in Christ and he begins to prune our lives, he cuts away the peripheral stuff. You can't do it on your own. You need help from one another. You need help from God, our, our Savior. Um, why do you prune branches? You prune them so the fruitful ones will be more fruitful, and so the ones that are dead can just die off and be thrown away. You want the nutrients to get to the healthy spot. That's what pruning is. And, and we're pruned as, as we worship and as we pray, as we open our lives to, to God before us, as we, as we study Scripture and as we ask for direction in our lives. Jesus said, I'm the vine, and I'll prune you. 
If you just abide in me, cling to me, hold on to me. One interesting thing about abiding with Jesus is that it'll put us in contact and abiding with, with others. We're connected to the same vine, Jesus, right? Um, and so we together abide. We don't just abide on our own. We abide with one another as we abide in Jesus. This week I had a conversation with a friend of mine who is a Church of God pastor, and he has a really good sense of humor. And we talked a little bit. We hadn't talked in a while, and I knew that the coronavirus had been very hard on his church and on different ministries and different things they had going on. So when I reached out to him, I just wanted to hear how he was doing, and I tried to encourage him and this, that, and the other. And he, he shared with me something. He said, now, you'll appreciate this. He said, um, you know, they're trying to kind of rebuild and start back, and they, had, they took a whole lot of losses. It was a hard time for their church, like I mentioned. And he said, there's a lady that he's gotten to know that he has started to invite to their church. He has prayed for her in her life. He's tried to encourage her in the challenges she's faced. And he's invited her to church. And, and she said she, gave, she had an excuse she didn't really want to go. And here's the excuse that, that's out there. When someone's not involved in a body of Christ, a lot of times it's, well, I'm spiritual but not religious. You, you know, I, I'm spiritual, I'm interested in the things of God, but I'm not wanting to be hooked to those crazy Christians. <laughs> or, I, I have a problem with organized religion. Okay? And again, I mean, I grew up in the South. I can look at churches and see that we've been a horrible example for a million different things. But remember, Jesus ordained the church, created the church, and he's the head of the church. And we're going to abide with him. And so we're going to have to abide with one another. And so he said, would you come? I really wish you'd come. I think, I think you, we could encourage you. And she said, I, 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 don't, I, I can't get along with organized religion. He goes, you're in luck. We're not organized at all. <laughs> he said, yeah, this is the part. He said, yeah, he said we were founded in 1920, and we haven't organized since then. <clears throat> Here's the thing. In the body of Christ, if we focus on clinging to Jesus with all that we have, I'm fully convinced some of those things that turn so many people off take care of themselves. Because we're interested in Jesus leading and guiding us. And we're interested in following him. And, and, and what he says when he says, follow me, he said, this is what glorifies me when you love me and you love one another. That's what, that's what he says. What does it mean to follow me? To love me. To take hold of me and to, to love others in my name. And, G and Jesus says, you know, when you abide in me, your job is also to bear fruit. And, th and that's what the fruit is. The fruit is sharing his love with the world. The fruit is saying, I don't know how to do this on my own, but I'm following Jesus with all that I have. The fruit is, can I walk with you? The fruit is, can I encourage you to follow Jesus? The fruit is loving someone in Jesus' name. That's what Jesus clearly says. By this will everybody know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus, if you look in the Gospel of John, in, in three different ways Jesus says to love. He says, love one another. But, you know, that's hard because that's wide open. And let's be honest, sometimes we're not great at loving one another. Let me, oh, I'm not going to confess for you. Let me just confess for me. It's hard to love one another. And then sometimes Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's a little clearer, but okay, if I really take a step back, when I look at the way I live my life, sometimes I don't really love myself very well. But then what does Jesus say? He says, love each other as I have loved you. Now that's clearer. Love each other as I have loved you. That's what bearing, that's what bearing fruit is, Jesus says. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me and bear much fruit. And he says, but this, apart from me, you can do nothing. Have you ever confessed to someone or to God, I can't do this myself? That's a scary place to get to. I can't do it. It's a place of vulnerability. I can't do this. But it takes a relationship to another level when you say, hey, I can't do this. I'm trying. I can't do this. When you, in a church or in a marriage or, in, or among friends, I, 
But what if you say to God, God, I can't do this. I need your help. I need your guidance. I think it was 15 years ago. We were in, it was maybe longer than that. I could have, I probably should have tried to figure out the date. We were in North Carolina at our previous church. And there was a challenge that we faced. And I remember just feeling the brunt of the challenge. You know, because... For good or ill, in every church that I've served in, I have taken it personally, it's been my personal responsibility to try to, you know, to take care of things. And, and that can be good and that can be bad. In this case, I was feeling the weight of this challenge. And I remember going walking late one Saturday night and praying about this matter. And praying, God, I don't know what to do. God, give me the words to say. God, help me talk to this person in a clear way. Help me to listen. Help me to understand. God, what is it you want me to do in this situation? And I remember, you know, I was just so anxious and worried about the church. And I remember clearly, not audibly, but completely clearly, the Lord saying, Andy, this is my church, not yours. You follow me. Clearly. I need to hear that more often. But I heard it that night, this is my church, not yours. You follow me. Have you ever confessed to God, Lord, I can't do it? Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Where in your life do you need to own that? Where do we need to say, Lord, we need you. We need you. You know, there's great news in this gospel. The gospel today says this. Jesus says, I am the vine, and I've come to you, and I'm reaching out to you, and I'm asking you to be the branches, and you cling to me, and you hold on to me, and I want you to bear fruit, because remember, apart from me, you can do nothing. And this morning, as I was thinking about those words and just kind of halfway reading them, halfway reciting them, halfway praying them, I thought about the difference between a branch on a vine and a branch and, and a tree. Okay, if a tree gets cut down, the tree is good for something. What do you do? You make lumber out of it. You can make chairs. You can, I mean, those were trees that you're sitting on. But if a vine is cut down, if it's not attached to the roots anymore, if the branches aren't attached to the vine anymore, is it good for anything? No. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so, as we consider Jesus' I am statement, I am the vine, the questions that, that we are each to ask are, where in my life, each of us are to ask, where in my life is God asking me to abide in Him more, to live for Him more, to trust in Him more? And then, another question for us to consider is where is God asking us to remember that we're attached to one another? If we're abiding in Him together, then we're hooked together. Where are we connected? Where are you connected to other Christians? Another question is this. Where does the Lord want to see fruit in your life? Love displayed. Generosity shown. Compassion shared. Jesus pointed to and celebrated. God thanked. Where does God want to see fruit? And where do you need to remember? Apart from Him, we can do nothing. This is a powerful, powerful chapter in Scripture. These verses are contained in Jesus' farewell discourse in the Gospel of John. In other words, for three years he had been teaching his disciples. And after three years they got to the point that he could share this kind of stuff. It's hard stuff. But Jesus invites us to recognize him being the vine and we are the branches. Maybe he needs to do some pruning in your life or mine. Maybe we need to cling and hang on more tightly. Maybe there are places where we have been lackadaisical about demonstrating fruit. 
and showing love. Maybe we need to remember, apart from Him, we can do nothing. Let's pray together. Gracious God, in these moments we come to you, and and you know each person in this room, and you know each heart. You know the places where we have blossomed and grown. You know the places where there is staleness, stagnation, maybe even death. Lord, we need your help as we seek to be firmly attached to you. We recognize that not only do you call us to cling to you, you call us to bless the world in your name and to point with whatever we have toward you. Sometimes our attitudes get in the way. Sometimes we hang on to other things as our vines. And those things don't last. Sometimes we recognize it, sometimes we don't. We need your help today. Lord, I ask that you would bless each person who's gathered here. I pray, Lord, that you would show us what it means to, to rely upon you as, as our vine. I pray that you'd show us what it means to hold on to you with everything we have. I pray, Lord, that you would, within this congregation and among these lives and in this community, that you would bear fruit. We need your guidance, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a friend who grew up in the country. Once we were talking about, he would, he would ride on the back of a tractor when they'd spread hay and all this kind of stuff. And he said, you know, whenever it got, they got to a bumpy patch and people started falling off, somebody would yell, grab holt, grab holt. <laughs> you ever heard that saying? What if Jesus is saying, I'm the vine, grab holt. Hang on to me for your expectations, for your hope in your life, in your family, at work, among your neighbors. Hold on to me. Hang on to me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Our hymn of commitment is hymn number 638, I Need Thee Every Hour. I'm I'm going to invite Praise First to come forward and help to lead us. But this is one that I want you to sing as a prayer from your heart. Maybe this is the, the step toward a deeper abiding in your life, a deeper connecting with God, a deeper clinging to God for everything. If you have a decision that you need to make, I'll be here to receive you. But let's stand and sing, I need thee every hour. Sorry about that. David said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I hope that you feel that way today after you've heard some of this good news. I hope that today you will leave this place and you'll chew on some of the truth of God's scripture. Read chapter 15 of John. This afternoon you'll have an opportunity to fellowship with other members of the church at 5 for the dessert auction. There's going to be a snack supper served 
but it'll just be a snack supper because we don't want to get in the way of dessert, you know, of course. And then the dessert auction will start at 545. So I hope you'll be here. You can invite friends. Um, and let's bow for our benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Go knowing Jesus loves you so very much. He calls you to hang on to him with all that you have and share that hope with someone else. Go in peace. Amen.